Hey, everybody. Welcome to Cardinal Conversations. Uh, it's beautiful outside. I don't know why you're here. <laughs> Maybe I think I do know why you're here, because the topic could not be more important, and I want to thank everybody for coming, especially Anne, who traveled the farthest to be here. Uh, my name is Michael McFall. Uh, I, with Neil Ferguson and a group of students in the front row here and, and elsewhere, uh, we are the committee that has put together Cardinal Conversations. This is our third conversation. Um, check the website for future ones. We have two more, right, coming this spring. Um, uh, tonight, we're going to talk about news and whatever the opposite of news is. Uh, and I'm going to let everybody define that in ways that they want to do so. Uh, we have a fantastic panel that I could easily spend all the time talking to them. Uh, but the idea is this would be a cardinal conversation, and so we want to make sure to get to you as fast as possible. I have, I literally have 12 questions, and I, we could get to 8.30 right away, but I want to stop around question three, so get ready to be engaged, uh, and we'll have microphones uh, roaming around to get you involved in the cardinal conversation. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I teach at Stanford. I'm in political science. I'm a Hoover Fellow, and I'm also currently the director of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. And I should say, by way of full disclosure, with this group, I also work for NBC News, and I write a monthly column for the Washington Post. So I'm also part of the media as, as, as well as analyzing it. Um, we have no left-right divides, no debate. I want to make that clear from the outset. Nobody is here to represent a certain view. Uh, if anything, and this is, this is very loosely, we thought we wanted to have uh, local, national, and international perspectives and blend them all together. But as you're going to see, all three of these people uh, can talk about all of those things. And I think Anne just wrote her next column tomorrow in the post about Facebook, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so Facebookers, uh, pay attention. It'll be, it'll be up soon. So let me introduce our panelists and then let's get started, okay? So to my right is Anne Applebaum, who is a columnist for the Washington Post and a prize-winning historian. Uh, with a particular expertise in history of communist and post-communist Europe. She's also a professor of the practice at the London School of Economics, where she runs a project called ARENA, a research project on disinformation uh, and 21st century propaganda. And that's why we wanted to hear here tonight. She's the author of several books, all of them have won many awards, way more awards than I'll ever win. Uh, her latest one is Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine. Uh, another book that my, all of my family has actually read when we lived in Russia, Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe. Uh, and her Pulitzer Prize winning book in 2004 was called Gulag, A History. Uh, and I'm, I don't think I've ever told you the story. Uh, I was ambassador for a while in Russia, and we went to the Gulag um, uh, Museum in downtown Moscow. And as, if you've ever been to a museum in Russia, you know there's the old babushki sitting there. They're pretty stern people. And one of my bodyguards said, you know, he's the ambassador from the United States. And she kind of gruffed. She didn't even look up. Uh, but then your book was there. And I said, I, I know that person. And she lit up. <laughs> uh, she's like, you know Ann Applebaum. Oh my goodness. Let me show you some special the things. The only person in Russia who likes me. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, there's more to Anne, but that, that's all you need to know about Anne. Uh, to my far left is Ted Koppel, who today is the Peter and Mimi Haas Distinguished Visitor here at Stanford University, returning after several decades of not being here. Ted, is that right? When did you meet your wife? 1960. 1960, here yeah. on Stanford campus. So it's great to have you back. Thank you. Um, I'm sure, as most of you know, he's the former creator and anchor of ABC News Nightline, a show that I actually started watching as a kid in Montana uh, after the Iranian hostage crisis was in full swing and got me interested in international affairs. Um, uh, so after 26 years of anchoring that fantastic program, he went on to do other things, including documentaries for the Discovery Network. Uh, he also is a New York Times bestseller. I guess, are you a New York Times bestseller too? Okay, so two of us are not, uh, but, but we're surrounded by New York Times bestsellers. Uh, his latest book in October 2015 was called Lights Out, Examining Unique Threats uh, to Our Time and Potential Ways to Talk About Cybersecurity, which I've heard you speak elsewhere about. He's also the 1986 uh, speaker for 
Stanford University graduating class of 1986, of which I was one of those in the audience Ooh. with you, Ted. Um, finally, Jessica Lesson is here with us tonight. She's the founder and CEO of The Information, uh, the publication known for original in-depth reporting about the technology industries. Uh, Jessica founded The Information in 2013 and serves as its editor-in-chief today. Previously, she worked for eight years at the Wall Street Journal covering the biggest tech companies, breaking major deals, product launches, and CEO changes. Um, we are thrilled that she's here with us tonight, especially given all the very interesting news that is happening just locally here with respect to news and non-news. All right, so let's get started. Let's start with just some fundamental big questions that should be easy to answer, but Turns out we're pretty complicated to answer when we were test running them with some of our experts. Um, what is news? What is fake news or disinformation? And how do we tell the difference? And I asked the how do we tell the difference cognizant of the fact that some of my colleagues here at Stanford uh, ran some experiments in 2016 and three quarters of the students that they exposed fake news with real news, could not tell the difference. Um, three quarters of the American people, just in a poll last week, said that every news program uh, runs some version of fake news. Um, and with technological advances, um, uh, the blending and the blurring of reality and virtual reality, fake news and real news, is going to become much harder, or so people around here say. So help us understand this, this basic issue of real news versus fake news. And if you don't like the word fake news, use whatever the opposite of news is. Ted, let's start with you. Well, I think the first thing we have to acknowledge, Michael, is that um, given, I mean, even back in the day when I was covering news on a daily basis, uh, when I was in Vietnam, for example, uh, I would shoot a story out in the field with a camera crew on film. The film would be sent back to New York via Saigon, Tokyo, Los Angeles, JFK, not yet JFK, um, Idlewild Airport in those days. Motorcycle courier would take it in. It would be three days from the time that I wrote the story and recorded the story before it got on the air. Um, nevertheless, wow. the, the, the problem of trying to meet deadlines has always meant that a certain amount of inaccurate information always gets into every newscast, every newspaper. It's part of the problem with journalism. You're trying to beat a deadline. I cite the three-day deadline back in 1967. These days, the deadlines are minutes, seconds. The likelihood that inaccurate information is going to get into the product is inevitable. It's always going to happen. So this, uh, you know, it's a, it's a false premise to begin with. The notion that if only we had this perfect news organization staffed by perfect editors, perfect reporters, then everything that got on the air would be accurate information, that's never gonna happen. What we're really talking about here is the difference between news and political propaganda. And that's where I think <laughs> you get into that awkward situation where from the very beginning, the minute I call what you do propaganda, uh, we, we have already defined our, our positions and neither position has anything to do <laughs> with journalism. Does that sufficiently confuse things that we can? That's a good yeah. start. We'll right. drill down on that in a minute, but I want to get both of you back into it as well, right away. Michael, to your point about news, and um, excuse me, I have to cough. Maybe Ann should go first. OK, Ann. <coughs> I'll go first. Um, I think you need to start with, um, first of all, understanding that there's no clear distinction. There isn't a thing called fake news and a thing called real news. Right. And there are levels and gradations. Um, uh, you, know, you need to talk about these things as on a spectrum. Um, that's the first point. Um, the second point is when we talk about fake news or when we talk about disinformation, 
um, you also have to think about it as different categories of thing. So for example, there are people who, there are fake identities, people who create fake identities online, people, we saw this in the, in the Facebook Russia story, people who create fake websites, um, people who pretend to be something that they're not. There's then a second category of thing of people who create um, fake audiences. So they, um, they pretend to have more followers than they should have on Twitter, or they pretend to have more followers on Facebook. You know, then there are people who create actual fake stories that have fake facts in them. Um, and then there are disinformation campaigns which seek to promote a fake narrative. So a story that moves over time you know, for example, that um, you know the white helmets in Syria are a false flag operation. This is one of the famous Russian propaganda campaigns, right. or that the Ukrainian government are really Nazis. Um, that was a Russian. That's an ongoing Russian propaganda campaign that goes on all the time. Um, and all of these things can be used at different times um, to create different senses of, of fake reality. Um, and the all of them. The other thing, important thing to understand: they've always all been with us. Um, it, was, it was possible to create fake information even in the days when you were sending video reels from, you know, from Saigon to New York and it took three days. Um, the Soviet government famously in the 1980s ran a whole long disinformation narrative campaign designed to prove that the CIA had invented AIDS. Right. Famous campaign and it started with articles that were planted in sort of Indian newspapers or Malaysian newspapers and then they were picked up by other newspapers and then they eventually appeared in an Italian left-wing paper and then someone picked them up in France and so on. Um, and that technique of planting things in different places is not that different from, um, from what happens today except that now it all happens um, much faster. So I think the, um, what has happened in the last um, several years is simply that the speed with which things happen and the quantity with which all these things, things can be faked and created has made, the, made it quantitatively different. So it, you know, you, you've always had fakes, you've always had mistakes, you've always had you know, people pretending to be people that they weren't, but the number and quantity of, um, you know, uh, the, and, and, and speed have made them into something different, which is that you can now actually live online in an alternate reality. You can read stories all day long that are completely fake. You can live in a world that has no bearing to reality. You can understand something completely different from what your next door neighbor understands. And you can have multiple people on the same block living in different places. Um, and that, I think, is the new element that has caused the political disruption that we've seen all over the world, actually, in the last couple of years. Lee Scurry, I want to come back to the Russians in a minute uh, in this regard. But are you OK, yeah, Jessica? I'm great. Um, I mean, to your question also of what is news, I think the business models around news right now have really clouded that as well. And so um, I think there's entertainment and then there's information. And um, that's why I named my company The Information because what we think of news and as is news and people are relying on for facts is really just designed to be engaging, to, to occupy as much time and clicks to thrive in the sort of ad-based business model. So I think today, news to me has always been about some transfer of information that is new and useful and valuable to people. And the vast majority of what we think of as news even today, um, I think is really more designed to entertain. Um, and that's another challenge in addition to fake news that I think we need to tackle. I wanted to get to that. And I wanted to get to the, the differences between news on the one hand entertainment and the business model that goes with that, and opinion, right? So there are some platforms, obviously, the Wall Street Journal, your, your publication, the Washington Post, the New York Times, that makes a very clear distinction between what they believe is news and opinion. There are other platforms that, that blur it on purpose. Uh, uh, and they're, you know, the, all the social media platforms, don't, they don't give you an a opinion channel an entertainment channel and a news channel. It just Facebook throws it all at you. YouTube throws it all at you. Um, and you know, Ted, I want to get you in on this too, Jessica. First, then to Ted about uh, national television in particular. If you look at when I think of uh, the glory days of, of, I 
I shouldn't have said that. We're live, aren't we? Never mind. <coughs> Let me retract that. Uh, um, I work for NBC <coughs> News. Uh, NBC News I work for. Um, uh, let, let's just say it's shifting. Um, and, you know, I saw your debate with Sean Hannity the other night. Are, is, he, is he opinion? Is he news? Rachel Maddow, is she opinion? Is she news? And is that blurring uh, something we should be sensitive to, or Michael, is it just think, part of the market? I think we need to build a little on what Anne was talking about before. The, the greatest change that has taken place in the last 10, 20 years is that there has been a democratization of the process of journalism. Again, when I began in journalism 55 years ago, if you weren't working for ABC, NBC, or CBS, you didn't have a national broadcast audience. If you weren't working for the New York Times, or the Washington Post, or the Denver Post, or the LA Times, you didn't have an outlet. It has only been in recent years that the internet has made it possible for quite literally anyone who may or may not have any background in the discipline of journalism, who may or may not have any association with the people that Anne has to work with, the people that I have to work with when I'm doing television, producers, fact checkers, <laughs> editors. There was, a, there was a discipline of journalism that existed 50 years ago that has been largely dissipated by the internet. That doesn't mean you don't still have people who abide by that discipline. Clearly you do. But the nature of journalism and the fact that we have such a wide diversity between fact and fiction, between what is made up, between propaganda, between the conversation I had with Sean Hannity when, when he asked me, you know, you think I'm bad for America? And I said, yes. And he said, why in effect? And I said, because you're more concerned with ideology than you are with facts. And that, I think, has been... The internet has changed the, has changed the operational manner of journalism. And then this, this drifting into ideology rather than fact uh, has been just a, has been the, the toxic icing on the cake. But, but surely we, we, like I, 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 you know, you write for the Washington Post on the op-ed page. But this is an interesting point yeah. because we are, it's true, the Washington Post had this traditional division and it was even to the point where the op-ed writers sat in a different part of the building and we weren't supposed to talk to the news journalists if we were writing the story. There were these sort of Chinese walls between opinion and news. Um, I think on the internet now, I wonder how many people who read the Washington Post news site, or especially people who see Washington Post articles in their Twitter feed or on their Facebook page, Not whether they have any idea which is supposed to be opinion and which is supposed to be news. Um, and I think point. a lot of the, there's been a kind of flattening of the, of the, of the journalism you know, profession and everything is now, you know, you can, you, can, you can read one thing from one magazine, one thing from the next, whether it's opinion or news or entertainment or journalism, you know, it all looks the same um, on your computer screen. Right. I mean, I think that's also changed, the, changed people's attitudes to the press. And I think it's contributed quite a bit to people's cynicism and distrust of the press. You know, they see all this stuff. Um, it comes from all different directions. It, you know, it seems to be, you know, how do you know which is quality, which is not? The old markers that we had don't really apply anymore. I think it's a great point, and I, I would add to it the, the blurring part. Uh, there are two other parts of it. I want to go back to the economics. Uh, but one with the cable news networks, you now have journalists that go on shows that are anchored by people that one might describe as having an opinion show, right? So I was just on television today. Actually, I got bumped because we were supposed to talk about Syria, and we ended up, they ended up shifting to Stormy Daniels. Um, and I am not an expert on Stormy Daniels, uh, so I did not comment. But it was striking to me that on the other side in the conversation was Peter Baker, you know, one of arguably one of our best journalists, but yet this conversation felt it was moving in this opinion place, so that blurring happens. 
tell me what you think of this. I want to come to the economics. Uh, one of our colleagues, I won't name them because we're on TV here, but uh, somebody who'd been at the Washington Post for many, many decades, very, uh, you know, I, a straight up journalist, I would say, talks about the clickbait pressure on the journalists there. And, you know, we now see the data that proves it in 2016. If you reported on Trump, you, your story moved up the ladder, and they now watch whose story is up and down. So that also goes back to the business model. That's why, so, yeah, yeah. That's my pivot no, sorry, back to the market. But, yes, exactly. So, um, you know, there are newsrooms that pay journalists based on how many clicks their right. stories get. Um, think when we started the information four years ago as a subscription business, we were kind of out in the wilderness of believing that people should pay for quality journalism and. Um, you know, reporters were skeptical that they could have impact with their stories and the like, but, um, you know, there has been a sea change around that. And so I think we can look at, um, you know, so I think that's the particular point about clickbait. We, we are seeing, we're seeing the Times and the Washington Post really embrace subscription. We're seeing a, not, a lot of new outlets doing it. And it matters because when you're, you know, we have 22 journalists at the information and San Francisco, New York, Hong Kong, and LA, and um, when they go to work in the morning, they're not thinking, how can I get the iPhone, since we write about tech, sort of the trump of clickbait is the iPhone, right? Um, in a headline, they're thinking, how can I get the maximum number of subscribers to read this article to subscribe? So incentives matter. And um, on the blurring question, I think it's completely agree that the internet has flattened and erased, um, you know, you can label news analysis on something, but what does that really mean? And the way I think about this is it's really about the transparency and trust with the reader. And so, um, you know, over time, you're building credibility, uh, either with your publication or as a writer, for facts. Um, it's okay to say what you think about those facts, as long as you're transparent about um, your agenda. And I think it's, um, you know, a little, it, I see it less as like, this article just has facts, this has opinion, but much more about how do we be valuable to the end reader and build a bond of trust with them. And um, there's a certain amount of transparency that you need to do that, but it's okay to say, um, you know, here are some facts and I've been covering this for a long time and here's what I think is gonna happen. One of the ways the business model has changed actually is that um, newspapers and news organizations now quite consciously seek to build a community of readers. So they seek to build trust. And so, you know, when Ted Koppel was on television um, every night, you know, he was a, you know, he was a trusted figure. People watched him and they believed what he said. Um, you know, people, newspapers and news organizations are now seeking to recreate that kind of trust, except that um, you know, each of them is now creating their own community. There's, there's no such thing as a nightly news that everybody watches. There isn't one program. There isn't Walter Cronkite in the evening or CBS News. Um, and so news organizations find their audience. They, they, they cultivate them. They know what kinds of people they're looking to reach. They think about expanding it, um, and they sometimes try to reach others. Um, but they, you know, essentially they're building communities around themselves. Um, and this is both good and bad. So you, you, a newspaper is a community, you know, you, you create a, a sense that this is the kind of thing I read and this is the kind of person I am. But that, of course, has also contributed, um, if you take a step back, to the really profound polarization that we now have in America, where people feel attached to news organizations because of their, their worldview, um, and they don't speak to other people, and they don't read what the other, you know, opposite or different news organizations say. And there's what we're losing very, very fast is a sense of public space and a, a shared space where, you know, neutral platforms where we can all talk and we can all agree that this is, you know, this is a medium or this is a news channel or this is a newspaper that we all share. And that's, I, I think that's the, the, the political impact of that is what we're feeling right now. It's also, it's also generational. Uh, I mean, you can talk to the young people in your classes here. And I guarantee you that no more than 10% of the students actually watch an evening newscast anymore. You don't have Do to. Do any of you? No. <laughs> no. Is there any Stanford time? student that watch an evening newscast? Oh, you don't, get your, you don't get your news from the evening newscast, right? No. 
and you know, that's part of it. The other part is, uh, I mean, to follow up on, on what you were talking about a moment ago, Mike. Um, I remember many years ago, Abe Rosenthal, who was then the executive editor of the New York Times, was approached by one of his correspondents who wanted to appear on Nightline. And uh, he said, Abe, is it, is it all right if I go and be a guest on Nightline? And Abe said, sure. Just don't come back to the New York Times. Right. Wow. Because in those days, A, the perception was if you worked for the Times, you worked for the Times, not for anybody else. And B, it also would have been inappropriate in those days for a New York Times reporter to be put in a position where I might ask him a question that would prompt him or her to give me an opinion as a response. And part of that is a, another aspect of the conversation that I know we'll come to sooner or later, and that's the business of journalism. The fact of the matter is that it is good for business for Peter Baker to appear on MSNBC or on CNN. It is good for business for those Washington Post reporters and those New York Times reporters to appear and to begin promoting the stories that are coming out next online day. or that are gonna be in the, right. in the next edition of the, of the paper. Uh, and, the, and the sad fact of the matter is that much of what is going on in journalism today and much of the anger that is, that is just swelling back and forth between the White House and the media uh, conceals the fact that it's very good for both sides. The president is having a wonderful time denouncing the media. And the New York Times and the Washington Post and MSNBC and CNN are all doing better than they've done in years. And that's partially responsible for the downward trajectory that's, that's been happening also. Too many things are being done because it's profitable to do it. Well, it's, it's, it's partly the president's denunciations, I mean, of the, certainly of the Washington Post, are part of what compelled people to subscribe to it. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the people felt they wanted to defend it. I mean, I had people say it to me after he began denouncing the Washington Post by name. You know, I, I took out a subscription just to show him, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to subscribe to your paper. So it's, it's, it's not just that the Washington Post enjoys denouncing Trump or, you know, or that it gets clicks from that. It's somehow created the sense that, oh, look, these are big public institutions. They're being attacked. We need to defend them. How do we do that? Let's take out a subscription. So that's, it's had a perverse effect on the, on the business model. I think others have been doing not as well. But uh, you know, I think, uh, well, I want to come back to that about the business model in two seconds, because I want to bring the social media platforms into this business model piece. And I only have two questions left. So get ready. Okay. I actually have 12 questions, but I'm only going to ask two more. So uh, get ready, especially Stanford students. Um, I want to ask one question about propaganda and foreigners, and then I want to turn to the platforms. So propaganda, let's turn to you, Anne. Because um, I'm uh, in charge of propaganda. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you watch it close, more closely than others, it seems to me. You write about it quite a bit. Uh, we were talking earlier that both of us in our uh, different parts of our lives and careers have experienced it. Um, been focuses of it. Have been the folk, mm -hmm. not just studied it, but have been the focus. How many people here on national television have been accused of being a pedophile? Raise your hands now. I just <laughs> All right, so that puts me in a class of one. But, uh, and I almost said as a joke, but I'm not a pedophile. <laughs> and that's exactly the problem, right? So, so when uh, I uh, became ambassador in 2012, uh, I experienced fake news and disinformation, and um, we used to call it Photoshop, right? But, but images of the back of my head, uh, <laughs> handing out money to the opposition, orchestrating uh, the overthrow of the Putin regime, uh, tapes of me uh, speaking to the U.S.-Russia Business Council one time, very famously, spliced in such a way that made it sound like uh, I was telling them about the plans to overthrow Putin. Uh, and that was all in 2012 when this technology was not very advanced. 
Uh, we know it's coming. We know it's here. We know that they can make videos of me talking right now and putting words into my mouth. Um, I know Larry Diamond's here somewhere. Larry Diamond got me in a ton of trouble. Uh, are you here, Larry? I can't see out there. All right, all right. Uh, I published a, in the Journal of Democracy a piece about Milosevic in Serbia, and they took out one word, um, and, the, and they kept posting the piece up every single day, but the, they took out the word not uh, and made it sound like I was hoping for Putin, the same thing that, that happened to Milosevic. And I got to tell you, I had a, an entire embassy behind me. I had an entire State Department and the White House and the communication staff of the White House. And uh, that theory, that argument that I was sent to Moscow to overthrow Putin, uh, we failed miserably at combating that disinformation. So uh, that, uh, that, sorry for the sidebar there, but uh, I just was remembering our conversation. You can talk about your experiences in Poland if you desire, yeah. but I want to hear what you think about the divide. We've talked about the divide between news, disinformation, uh, uh, opinion, uh, news. Now I want to talk about news and propaganda. Uh, and I'm interested particularly in United States, but I'm interested in the comparative piece too. How do we distinguish between news and propaganda? And when I think of propaganda, I mean propaganda not in the opinion of an individual, but when a state is using a platform of some sort, <laughs> RT or bots or whatever, uh, or the BBC. I want to. I want to. I want you to tell us the difference. What? How do we? How should we distinguish between? state-owned media designed to advance the national interests of a country, and how should we regulate it to keep us in a democratic and free society? I can we'll really, go this way, okay? I can really only speak about the ones I, I know and understand very well, and that would be Russia. I mean, I can talk about the BBC too, I suppose. Um, uh, you know, and I know that the Chinese have a different way of doing this, and there are some, there are some other different examples. Um, but the Russian, uh, you know, the, 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 the modern Russian uh, propaganda derives very much from what I was talking about before, from these old Soviet traditions of creating fakes. Um, it, they, and it's, it, what happened was is they, um, they understood, I think, before anybody else, that the, the possibilities of the internet, um, not just social media, although social media, eventually they understood that too, that it could be used to create fakes faster. Um, so, for example, I mean, so one of the ways I learned about Russian propaganda was by, as, as, a, as you alluded, um, following a story that was a series of stories that were written about, written about myself. It's always interesting when you read about yourself, so, you know, you pay more attention to it. And the way it worked was, there were, I won't tell you all the details, but there, oh, was go a, ahead. The, no, there was a story about me and what I saw was, that it was written by a journalist who was based in Moscow, writing in English. And then I, I saw it on one website, and then I saw it on another website, um, and then I saw it on a third website, and it, they, it was bounced around several times, and then by the time it was on the fourth or fifth website, it didn't allude to the original story. Right. Um, so the idea was to create a sense that there's this story everywhere out there, and you know who, where is it coming from, and um, it must be true because I see it repeated in so many different places. Um, and that model is something you, that turned out to be even easier to do on social media. Um, you can start a story on Twitter, you can have somebody else echo it on Facebook, you can then bounce it back and have somebody quote it, and then by the third or fourth quote or time, you know, it's a real story and it starts bubbling up on people's Twitter feeds, and at that point, a mainstream news journalist will say, oh look, everybody's talking about this on Twitter, it must be true, shouldn't we be investigating it? I mean, and we actually saw there was a version of this recently um, after the murder of, a, sorry, the attempted murder, the attempted assassination of a Russian in London. Um, this was exactly how fake stories about that assassination were pushed up um, the, the news chain and even made it into the, main, into the mainstream press. Um, how do you qualify or quantify that? Um, you know, essentially these are, as I, as I said in, you know, at the very beginning, these are narratives. So this isn't, propaganda isn't just one story. It's not just right. um, a story about a, you know, a, a building burned down and that wasn't true. Um, they are, they're usually a chain of stories and they have a political purpose. They're intended to 
you know, create an image or create a division or create a, a political change, and they're designed to do that. Um, and one that most people here won't know about, I, again, I happen to know about it because I live part of the time in Poland, is a, there has been a long-running attempt to create conflict um, between Poland and Ukraine. Okay, these are two countries that were closely linked, and Poland played a big role in bringing Ukraine closer to the European Union. And over the last two years, there has been a series of incidents, some online and some offline, to do with vandalism and cemeteries and people, Ukrainians living on the Polish border and vice versa, that doesn't matter, um, designed to create, to recollect old historical arguments, to bring back topics, to inflame the far right in both countries, um, to create nationalist antagonism, and to push that up the scale so that it becomes a real political conflict and it becomes a and real antagonism between Poland and Ukraine. So propaganda has a political purpose. It, there's, there's a strategy behind it. Um, it has a goal, it's meant to achieve something, whether a break, whether an internal division, um, or a political conflict. I think that's, um, and that's quite different from, you know, the BBC making a mistake, or the BBC going on a little bit too much about the royal family, you know, which you could say that's propaganda, um, or maybe that's just being British, you know. Um, <laughs> But the, but the BBC does not, as a rule, seek to create a political change in another country or even in its own country by, the, by a series of false reports, by a series of structured echoings, by you know, creating a bot farm that will then support and pump out the same thing. So I think, it's, I think it's a, you have to understand that propaganda is part of a political strategy and it has that kind of goal. And I think that's how you, that's how you can know what it is. Okay. And what should we do about it? Just go oh, ahead. It's just that. Um, well, I do think. Um, How big, well, let me get, chew on it from a more local perspective here, right? We've learned a lot about what the Russians have done on various platforms. How, should we be regulating it? Should we be pushing them off? Does RT have a right, as the editor in chief told me the other night on Twitter? Uh, we have a right to be on these platforms, uh, or should we have a different approach to them if what Anne just described to us suggests that they shouldn't be treated like we treat other journalists? Well, I mean, I think this is kind of the conversation of our time because it gets down to free speech, ultimately, in some ways. But look, there is a class of activity that we saw on Facebook and Twitter um, that is, you know, the fakes sort of propagating, as Anne said, not real accounts. Um, and I think of that as like spam. You know, most of us don't experience spam in our inboxes much these days because our service providers got really good at policing it. Right. Um, and the tech platforms were slow to realizing that they needed to apply um, the same tools and the same cat and mouse game um, against, you know, what's flat out false misleading people who aren't say they are. Um, you know, there's this really um, gray category of sort of political speech that um, many, many people find very, very offensive. Um, and, but, you know, in the U.S. at least, and of course these tech platforms have to play a different game in every country and abide by their rules, but, um, you know, we're, I think we're going to be in a tension over it for a long time. You know, Facebook has come out and said, okay, we're going to basically create a database of this. So if you want to buy an ad and you're a political or issue-based group, um, you're gonna have to register, then people will see which ads you bought against your account. Um, there's some legislation in Congress is moving in this direction as well. I think it'll be an interesting experiment, but um, I think- What do you think, think of the Facebook decision to take down all these uh, accounts connected to the Internet Research Agency, the Russian the Russian media called that a violation of the American First Amendment. They didn't point out know, that yeah. they're not American <laughs> citizens, but they said those outrageous Americans violating well, the First a, Amendment you rights. You know, I mean, look, I think we're seeing the platforms become the, the public outcry uh, against what's happened and the manipulation of the election. And I think the values of the leadership of these companies are going to cause them um, to be safe rather than sorry. And I think that they are um, going to, uh, you know, some people will think it's restricting speech. Some people will think it's um, cleaning up the community. Some people will think it's, you know, but it's, what it is is it's a very editorial role. Right, um, right. 
And so I think one interesting question is, as the platforms move in this direction, um, unfortunately we're seeing it in a very tragic way play out at YouTube, but um, that shooting was also over, uh, you know, the woman disagreed with how her content was being treated by YouTube. So, um, but I, I think it's gotten, um, the public is, is angry, um, Washington is angry, and I think tech companies are going to police very aggressively and, and kick off a lot of um, actors, you know, whether they're good or bad, I don't know, but they're going to be safe rather than sorry, I think. Okay. Ted, I, what do you think? Well, first fight, of all... How to fight propaganda uh, from look, out external actors that want to do us harm. The, the Internet is, among its many virtues and attributes, is a weapon of mass destruction. Can be, is being, and will be used as such. We're not just talking now about the, about the process of conveying false information. Uh, what my book was about, in fact, was the notion that both the Russians and the Chinese are inside our infrastructure and have gotten in there by virtue of the internet and have the capability of taking it down. So it, it is capable of being a physical weapon of mass destruction but from a propaganda point of view, it has a far more exalted goal these days than it used to in the past. And that goal is quite literally undermining our confidence in the institutions of our nation. And we're in the, we're in the sorry situation today, where on the one hand, the Russians and undoubtedly other adversaries of ours out there uh, are undermining confidence in our institutions. And at the same time, uh, the administration is doing its own fair share of undermining confidence in the institutions. If you succeed in doing that, and one other thing, attribution, it becomes incredibly difficult to know precisely who is doing what. And absent the ability to determine who's doing it to you, it becomes increasingly difficult to come up with any kind of response. Okay. Anne, you wanted to get in on this? So I think the response to Russian and other forms of state propaganda, and by the way, um, what the Russians are doing is others are already doing too. It's going to be, right. this is the, the, the idea that you could end this problem by taking down the Internet Research Agency um, I mean, I don't think even Facebook thinks that's that's true, but it's you, you know, you're simply eliminating one piece of the problem, and then somebody else will will come along and do the same thing. Um, I think there are going to have to be changes in the way, much more fundamental changes um, in the way we use the internet, and maybe even in the way the internet is regulated over time. And I think people are coming now finally to that um, that conclusion. Um, there may have to be some limits on anonymity. I mean, there may need you know, you, you know, for example, when you use Twitter, why can't everybody be verified on Twitter if they want to be verified instead of having this blue check that goes to some people and not other people and it's not ever clear why? On the spam analogy, and, I think and it's then really could, interesting. And then couldn't you um, choose to only deal with verified people, for example? Right. Um, there are other issues to do with websites. Um, you know, shouldn't we have some transparency about where a website comes from? Shouldn't we be able to check who made this? Right. Um, and if it's not known who made it, maybe when you download the website, couldn't, you know, sometimes you, you get a little thing that says, beware, there's malware. Do you want to download this or not? You know, it's up to you. You could also have a note saying, we don't know where this website comes from. You know, download it at your own risk. And that wouldn't be censorship. You wouldn't be eliminating things. You would just give people more information. You know, you would know you're dealing with someone anonymous or with a website that's anonymous. So those are the, and those would begin to eliminate some of the ways in which people abuse the system and, and abuse and, and use fakery. Um, the bigger and more profound problem, and Ted kind of alluded to this, is that the, you know, how do you deal with these false narratives or these deliberately, these d political designs, you know, political campaigns designed to create division? And some of the answer to that is you then create counter narratives. Um, you begin to think about how do you, you know, how do you do a narrative about healing the relations between Poland and Ukraine? But then you need the cooperation of the governments. You need, um, you need to be thinking much more carefully about who, um, who and how you're going to promote those kinds of ideas. And that's, you know, that then gets us into into all kinds of issues that we had in the Cold War about do we use Voice of America? Do we use 
um, you know, do concerned citizens do this? Is it going to be NGOs who begin doing counter net counter? Net? And there's actually a big conversation about that going on right now um, among the people who do this and talk about it. Who's responsible for doing that? Who should pay for it? Um, is it something regular journalists do? Is it something the government does? Um, but we're we're getting close to understanding how you could do it, but the, the the details I think have yet to be worked out. So that gets me to my last question. We've talked more than I thought, so I apologize for that. But this is interesting to me, and I hope it's interesting to you. Demand for news, demand for better products. You know, uh, I've had this conversation with some companies around here, with some people in the media, very senior people, and they say, Mike, you know, it's your, your utopian world about getting people more information. They don't want more information. That we're giving them what we want. And this gets back to the, the market things we were talking about. Um, I've looked at some uh, algorithms, otherwise known as editorial policy. And um, in fact, you mentioned white helmets earlier today. So I just went onto my computer uh, to on YouTube to see what, what do you get when you uh, search on YouTube for white helmets. Let me give you the top 10 from mine. Of course, it's different from everybody, for everybody, right? But on my computer at work, this is what I get. This is a Syrian humanitarian organization, yeah, for, for those who don't know. Thanks, yeah. thanks for the footnote. A brilliant um, and amazing organization. Uh, tr yeah. Thank you for the footnote. Uh, here's what I get from YouTube. And no disrespect to YouTube. This, well, I could say this about other YouTube searches. YouTube is next after Facebook, actually, in dealing with these OK, problems. well, they're, the they're first thing coming. you get is the Netflix trailer about the documentary. So that's, that's business. Yeah, that's OK. Then you get Al Jazeera, number two, for me. Then uh, 3RT, 4RT, 5RT, 6RT, 7RT. That's Russia Today, for those who don't know. 8th NBC, 9th RT, and 10th CNN. Think about that. You can Don't do it now, but pull out your phones and search White Helmets and see how uh, other people have decided for you editorial with a, a editorially based on your clicking. And I, I can figure out why this happens to me personally. Uh, but that's no good. That's a bad product. That's horrible. That it may, it may be, and another thing that we may have to start thinking about is, can we all begin to have some insight into the algorithms and how they're made? And is not, if not control. Like why can't, and, and that's, that's my last question. How, how do we create market demand for news? Michael, Jess, I, I, you or know, Ted, or Jess, we'll just go this way and then to the audience, yeah. Um, this is going to sound like a very old-fashioned answer, but I think it's quality. Uh, the fact of the matter is the same young people that I asked about watching network news, and they don't. When I, when I changed the question, I said, how many of you listen to NPR? More than half the hands in the class went up. NPR is putting out a quality news product. The New York Times, the Washington Post are putting out quality news products. I would urge them to be a little more concerned about not becoming identified with those television programs that they appear on with such frequency these days. I think that undermines the confidence that would be there if people simply sample the product. And I think the answer to all of this is going to be there is such there is such a, a welter of information out there. There is such a, a load, quite literally, of material out there that ultimately it's going to be quality that rises to the top. Here's some optimism for you. Jessica? No, I, I agree completely. I mean, when we started the information, I, there were a gazillion tech blogs. So there was no reason that we needed to write more articles about Google and Facebook. Um, and Apple, but with a team of then two people, um, we wrote good articles about companies that people cared about, and that was enough to um, propel our business and get us some millions of dollars of revenue and profitable. So I, I think that there's plenty of evidence that people are looking for um, better news, and as much as we can look at the past 10 years on the internet and think, oh, Facebook just killed our business, um, you know, I really think it's been that the news industry has been asleep at the wheel in not delivering a product of quality that people really want. And the minute I think publishers and broadcasters 
look at the world as one where there's tremendous demand for their product if they live up to it, it's, it's a much better place. And you get the last word, final word, 11th hour, lots of metaphors there from MSNBC. Uh, and then we'll go, to the, the, we'll go to the outside. Are you as optimistic as they are? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I, I do agree. There is a market for quality news. Um, I was recently in Jacksonville, Florida, for never mind why it just was, um, and met there the editor of the local newspaper, which is still making money off of a daily paper edition. Wow. And that's because they have a very small circulation. Um, it goes to, it's very, very expensive. Um, it goes to people who really want to know how lo about local politics and how things work and who are willing to pay a lot of money for a good daily paper. And he was, you know, surviving on that. And so you can, and look, The Economist magazine proved a long time ago that you can shoot upwards and you can make money by having a, a higher quality audience. Um, I don't think that fixes the problem of um, stuff that comes up on your phone when you, you know, when you click in something and... Um, it's a bad YouTube voted video about, about the white helmets. Um, and I don't think we, you know, I, I still think the, the, the problem of, uh, you know, what we're going to do about the algorithms, what we're going to do about fake identities, what we're going to do about fake followers, um, I think all of these things, you know, they're still distorting how a lot of people see information and see the news. And until those kinds of problems are solved, I don't think we can relax. Yeah, last so yeah. I because I, I think about this a lot. The the challenge is though if we spend too much time focusing on getting other tech companies to fix their businesses, I, I do worry that that um, you know I mean it, it it's important, but it also is going to leave this huge void and around what's created to begin with. And one of the things that I've sort of been arguing for a while is that I think sort of the news and tech platforms need to like break up. Um, and instead of seeing them as the be all and end all for distribution, um, really saying, okay, they're, they're gonna have huge user bases and they can be helpful to spreading our content, but at the end, we have to own our audience and we have to build that audience. And, we, and you have to create your audience. I yeah. agree with that. So the opposite of the Netflix model then. So Netflix started with yeah. just being like a yeah. utility, now they've gotten into the content. And also sort of the opposite of the cable model. So, I mean, what's interesting is um, in cable, like you see the most popular channels like HBO, now it's ESPN saying, we don't want to rely on Comcast. We want to go directly to consumers and have them sign Interesting. up. Um, and so I think there are values to the bundles, but um, you know, the tech platforms will be there, but they're never, they're in the business of you know, creating value for their shareholders. Um, and there's no amount of sort of lip service can, can change the fact that they're going to be beneficial to publishers. I do think this is different from policing them for propaganda and the other stuff that right. has to happen, but um, you know, it is an important difference. Yeah. Right, so let's get the audience involved. I can't see the people with microphones. Do we have them? It's like the KGB. Okay. You know, they used so to here's, put here's what we're going to do. I'm going to just let the microphone holders identify people. Uh, and let's just make sure we have a diverse, well, right behind you there, Mark. We'll, we'll start there and then just but let's keep them moving quickly. So you just find somebody over here on this side, and we'll just keep going ping pong. All I would ask is ask a question. Feel like you're on Twitter and not the news hour. Um, and uh, identify yourself for our guests here, OK? Clickbait questions. Clickbait questions. Isaac, I see Isaac. I know him. So, Hi, uh, I'm Isaac. Sorry. I'm a sophomore here studying political science. And my question is, Stefan Waltz recently came out with an article in Foreign Policy magazine arguing that the substance of Trump's foreign policy is very similar to that of Obama's. But just from my casual observation, the media treats Obama and Trump on foreign policy very differently. So do you think that the media is treating Trump fairly? And if not, is that another potential threat to the institution of media in this country? It's a, it's a very, very good question and a, and a very perceptive one because I think the answer is no. Uh, I don't think that the media is, <laughs> it's not a question of fairly. The media in many respects seems to have made up 
its minds. And I'm talking now about cable television. Whether it's Fox on the right or MSNBC on the left or CNN occupying whatever territory it thinks it's occupying, um, the, the, the reality is that they, have, they are treating the president like a commodity. It's a commodity that sells. And because it sells, they, you know, they pound away on the subject day after day after day. And I think the, the thrust of your question is exactly right. Are they treating him the same way they treated Obama? Certainly not. Are they treating his foreign policy the same way that they treated Obama's? Certainly not. Uh, is it understandable from a human point of view that when the president is, is lambasting the press every single day of his life, that the press or is going to... I want to be clear about that. He's just lambasting parts of the press. Let's just There's, be clear no, about that. You're exactly yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I've looked at the numbers that the so-called mainstream no, no, Fox, media... Fox and Friends is doing very, very but well. But all the radio yes. stations, too. So this, let's just remember that this, even this conversation, this mainstream media is... When you look at it from the numbers point of view, most people aren't watching either MSNBC or CNN uh, in, in total. So I, just a small uh, uh, mark. It's not the media. He's, he's taking aim at one part of the media. He's, that he's is not taking aim at all. absolutely true. But I think the you thrust disagree. of Good. the question is We finally got a fair. disagreement. Ann just said she disagrees. Go, go <laughs> ahead and we'll go back. Of course. I disagree. I think Trump is fundamentally different from Obama. And one of the difficulties that the media but, but has. That, but that wasn't the question. No, that wasn't the question. You're right. No. I also, by the way, and let's not talk about this because it would take too long. I don't think his foreign policy is the same either, but that's, <laughs> a, but that's another. But the, the fact is that Trump um, almost daily, he did it again today actually, um, uh, is either breaking a norm or in some cases breaking what I thought was a law um, or <laughs> challenging the Constitution. The, the, the difficulty the media has with Trump really is the need to constantly um, you know, take account of the many ways in which he's breaking rules or the many ways in which he's um, uh, uh, you know, threatening the Constitution or threatening, um, you know, threatening congressional procedure or um, misusing language or telling lies. And this need to constantly tell him account, you know, to keep him to account, constantly say that was a lie, that was a lie, that wasn't true, um, is part of what makes the media coverage so frustrating and hard but to Dan, watch. You're, you're, you're simply um, preaching to the choir. Because, uh, you know, those, those, you people, so those people who will agree with the notion that he is lying constantly, and, and there is ample evidence to support that. I've never that. had a president who lies constantly but, every day. But you've still, got, you've still got roughly 40% of the country that is just as adamantly convinced that it's the media that's lying and not Trump. And my point is, I think at a time like this, Lyndon Johnson used to say, never get into a mud wrestling match with a hog. You're both going to get dirty, and the hog loves it, right? So, so we, so, so the media should not say he's lying. That's a, that's a, that's tricky. No, on the contrary, I think the media has to be absolutely crystal clear that it is engaged in objective reporting. If there is objective reporting to be done on the fact that the president is lying, by all means, do it. But you don't hammer away. I mean, take a look at your op-ed page in the post. Has there been a day in the past year when you haven't had an op-ed on Trump, on one or another of Trump's perceived or real failings? Actually, I, I was just on a panel with George Will last week, and? Uh, who writes for the Washington Post, right. and he's only written six columns. He's very, he announced it in front of 800 people on Donald Trump, precisely because he, he's a very conservative and he wants to write about conservative ideas. But point, Point taken or not, I mean, do you want to, what do we do? I, I actually think this is a pretty fundamental question, right? Because we are at Stanford believe that there are facts and there's data and there's hypotheses. And yet when we're talking about these things, it, it, it is, it's like the, the conversation we were having earlier about fake news. You then denounce it, but your denunciation then becomes a pol polarized thing. Well, that's what because do we the do? president yeah. himself has made this into the subject. I mean, he... You know, he. Why does he talk about the Washington Post as fake news? He does yes. that because he wants to undermine 
um, the, the, you know, the, the Washington Post criticism. So when the Washington Post said, so the first thing he did the first day he was, he was in office, he said um, he exaggerated the number of people who'd been at his inauguration, okay? And that was literally almost the first news, I think it was the first news conference that he gave. So what is the correct reaction to the press? The press says, that's not true. You know, those were, you know, he, there were more people at Obama's inauguration. And his reaction to that is, you're lying. You're fake news. You're illegitimate. Right. Um, and so his game is to undermine, literally make it impossible to know what the truth is. Game. That is that is why he that is why he says what he says. The game. And which is, by the way, exactly how Russian propaganda functions. The, you know, the, the idea is to put out lots and lots of stories, criticize the messenger, and constantly and and essentially erase the idea that there is truth. You know, the famous story is of the. Um, the, the, the plane crash over Ukraine um, in 2014. What was the Russian reaction to that plane crash? It was to put out 300 different stories about the plane crash, to say it was, you know, the Ukrainians did it, you know, the Americans did it, you know, the CIA did it, on and on and on. And the idea was to erase the idea that you can never even know who did it. And that is essentially Trump's attitude to the press. You know, if you, if you continue, putting out dozens of different stories. That wasn't really me on the tape. It was me on the tape. It was, and you, and you continue undermining and reversing what you say. Eventually, people say, we have no idea what's true. We can't possibly know. It's impossible. Everyone's lying. No. And he has very successfully done that. But Anne, the game is to try to induce the press into that kind of a back and forth, that kind of a ping pong match. He excels in that kind of game. We shouldn't let ourselves get dragged into it. That doesn't mean that when he, when he says something that is outrageously untrue, by all means, put a story out that corrects the record. But you can write a perfectly objective, clear, apolitical story that says he was lying, and his reaction will be, it's fake news. Let him do it. Yeah, but then let him do it. it. Yeah, He's going to uh, do it anyway. Just a historical footnote, and then we'll get to more questions. I, I worked at the White House for the Obama administration for a while, for three years. Uh, and by, just back then, the op-ed page of the Washington Post was considered extremely conservative uh, and supported back to the question about, it was very anti-Obama. They're friends of ours, uh, so I don't, th whether they would say that or not. Fred Hyatt and Jackson Deal, we can name them, and were considered by the White House in the Obama years as being extremely conservative. So I want to make sure we understand that this is not, to me, a left-right issue that Anne's talking about. This has something else to do with news versus not news. Okay, sorry. Pick somebody. Make sure they're really smart. Okay, go ahead. Oh, God, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. So I'm <coughs> Mackenzie. I'm a master's student in international policy studies. Uh, my background is in uh, building tech companies. So first, I just want to say, Jessica, thank you for building basically the only source of tech news that I think actually captures quality journalism uh, in the tech space that isn't just a marketing farm for tech companies. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. And the second question is around business models and quality journalism. Are, is anyone on the panel, but especially Jessica, worried about the impact of essentially delivering quality journalism only for those who can afford it and what that would do uh, for those who can't afford maybe to have access to that same level of quality. Thanks. Question? Thank you. Hopefully Jessica can talk. Yes. Waiting. I can. Um, okay. I, I think about it all the time. Uh, anyone can read any information article. They don't have to be a subscriber. They do have to give us their email address so we can communicate with them um, and let them know what we're up to. I, um, so we, I do think about that. I think, um, you know, I, I get this, com I'm in a constant conversation um, with friends who run free news publications or, around this topic. Um, and the way I always see it is um, so much of what gets written is really um, aggregated versions of original news that is created in a given day. And um, you know, that really helps spread the information in, and the journalism that's being done um, into broader forums. And if we don't have that original reporting to begin with, um, you know, cable news isn't going to have its headlines. Broadcast news isn't going to have their headlines. Um, 
a lot of the major publications aren't either. So I think it's something we definitely have to pay attention to. And um, most publications have a model where uh, their journalism can be accessible to the direct audience that isn't the sort of heavy consumers of it. Um, but even in a model where we had a lot of paywalls, I think the benefits to the public of the important information getting out there are still going to happen through aggregation. So I think we're all better off because there will be higher quality information. Somewhere over here? Yeah. Hi, my name is Dirk. I'm a master's student in symbolic systems. Um, so I had a question about... Can you do a quiz? Does everybody know what symbolic systems is here? No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead, go ahead. So I think throughout the discussion, you've been trying to be very impartial and politically neutral. And it just reminded me of a criticism that was raised after the Brexit referendum to the BBC pretty frequently, where it was said that by trying to remain impartial and sort of offering an equal measure to remain and to leave in terms of viewing time, they were sort of providing a platform to fringe views that were patently false. So my question is whether you think that by trying to remain impartial, news media are sort of making life harder for themselves? I'm sorry, making life hard for Harder for themselves and sort of making, or, or almost a bit, providing a platform for, for fringe views. This, this is an interesting question. This is a big question in Britain right now, actually. Um, if you have uh, two, you know, if you have a debate on the BBC, the BBC actually has rules that you always have to have somebody for an issue and somebody against it. You always have to have people on both sides of the issue, and they spend a lot of time trying to find two points of view. And so, I mean, there are some issues, for example, climate change, where on one side you'll have a scientist who has a view, and then on another side you'll have somebody who's not a scientist, but who nevertheless has a view about the science. And it's now become, this has now become a, a controversial, you know, so is it fair that the person who doesn't know the science is on the same platform as the person who does know the science, and should they be treated equally as having equally weighted opinions? Um, the BBC runs into this problem now all the time with, um, with Brexit as well, you know, where you have people who know things about the EU arguing against people who don't know things about the EU, and nevertheless they're shown as being difficult. And this is, a, this is an instance <coughs> when you can argue that impartiality in journalism is actually giving a false picture of reality because you're giving equal weight to views that aren't necessarily equal. Um, I don't know the resolution to it, but it's, it's, now, it's become much more controversial in Britain, this practice of, of, of reporting the news that way. I, I, I think it's probably appropriate to point out at this time that up until 1987, we had something similar in this country. It was called the Fairness Doctrine. And it was imposed by the FCC, by the Federal Communications Commission, and required, as Anne described it uh, at the BBC, that if you put on a, a political position from one point of view, you had to balance it with a political position from an opposing point of view. In 1987, under the Reagan administration, the Fairness Doctrine was eliminated. And in 1988, not altogether coincidentally, a young man by the name of Rush Limbaugh began broadcasting. And it has gone downhill from there on in. The, the advantage of this impartiality is that it does create a neutral space. So the, one of the reasons why Britain is less nutty than some other places um, is that it has still the BBC. It still has a kind of neutral place in the middle of the political spectrum. Everybody will appear on it. Nobody finds it anathema. The right wing will show up on it, the left wing. You, know, you, you don't have this bifurcation um, that you have in this country. You know, the downside is that then sometimes the impartiality seems a bit silly. But. I think it's just also important. You can be impartial without giving equal weight to it. I, think. I mean, it's sort of, and that is, um, you know, we also have to talk about not just individual articles, but the volume of articles and what editors are deciding to focus on. So I think that's a distinction there. Point, and don't forget we have this First Amendment thing, so uh, we have to be respective of that in this, this debate too. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm gonna shut up. Uh, yeah, my, my name is Stuart, uh, I'm an alum. Nowadays I'm a novelist and librettist. As you've noted, there are quality sources of news that have stood the test of time, and, and I feel personally that I can be judicious and be well-informed by looking at the Post, by looking at the Times, the non 
op-ed page or the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street, Street Journal, Journal. yes, right. let's not forget. Okay. Non-op-ed page. Uh, uh, the Economist, BBC, NPR. What I've noticed is that the public has, at least the American public, has become more gullible and more inclined to accept bizarre conspiracy theories and not be judicial in selecting news sources. And indeed, you have an entire major American party that has gone into denial that there is global warming, which is an unfounded fact. So my question is, can, what role can the press play to bring back a rational public and a rational political discourse that is fact-based? Yeah, that was my question at the end, <laughs> so I'm glad you asked it again. And, and Ted, let's start with you, because let's start with a little, talk a little more about national television. There are some that say the same process of market demand has had a big impact on shows on ABC and oh, absolutely. CBS absolutely. and Nightline. Yep. So tell us how you see this evolution about this, that we want everybody to eat spinach and well, read The Economist, look, but it turns out people want to look at news on Instagram. That's, that's My sons want to look at news on Instagram, that, not The Economist. That's why I suggested that we spend a little bit of time talking about the business of journalism. I remember getting a phone call from my old friend Peter Jennings. This had to be about 25 or 30 years ago. And he said, have you heard from the, uh, from the accountants? And I said, yeah, I just got off the phone with one of them. And what they wanted to know was how many times a year had Nightline used a report from, as it turned out, our Moscow Bureau? And he said, yeah, that's what they wanted to know from me also. And in point of fact, the accountants were going around to every ABC news program and talking to the managing editors and saying, how many times you use the, the Moscow Bureau? And the bottom line, and I'll put it in simple numbers, was collectively we had used, let's say, 50 reports, and it had cost $2 million. You divide 50 into $2 million, $40,000 a piece, close the Moscow Bureau, which they did. They did, yes. And which they have done all over the world. When I was a young foreign correspondent, I was one of about 35 foreign correspondents at ABC. You know how many they got now? Five. Five. Why? Because it's expensive. And you know what's cheap? What's cheap is having people sitting on a desk, five or six of them in a row, yelling at each other. That's cheap. <laughs> And that's where television news has largely gone over the last... And, and television news broadcasts anyway, even though collectively they still get tens of millions of viewers every night, they're mostly people over the age of 55 or 60. And the fact of the matter is young people are not watching anymore, and the evening newscasts are going to die. All right, let's keep moving. We're going to end on a good let's note. Try. So uh, next question. Way in the back, it looks like, yeah? I can't see you, but <laughs> introduce yourself. Uh, Nick, I'm Nick Burns. A uh, question about the business of journalism while we're on the subject. Uh, the Greek historian Thucydides began his work with the statement that uh, I am writing this not for the applause of the moment, but as a possession for all time. Do you, that seems to imply that you can't do both. Uh, in your opinion, is journalism for the applause of the moment? Is it a possession for all time? Or can it do both at once? I think it can do both at once. I, I mean, I really do. I, and I think that um, in a world of quality where you have real differentiated content, you have to move beyond the like what's valuable in that minute um, to something that really um, can inform and, and maybe often be a little more evergreen. So I think one of the things the internet has done is it's taken away the sort of this happened um, part of journalism that newsrooms um, used to focus on and, and move to other added areas of value. So 
I think that by thinking a bit longer term, um, news organizations might actually build better businesses. I, I actually write both journalism and history books. Yeah. Um, and they're, they are different. Um, you know, they always say journalism is the first draft of history. Um, and that's true not just because you sometimes make mistakes. In fact, almost you always make mistakes. You miss a story, you miss a piece of it because you're doing it fast and you have a deadline and so on. But also because our perception of events does change over time and things look different in retrospect, you know, as you understand what happened next, you know, the meaning of an event shifts and changes. Um, and so I do, I completely agree that um, there is such a thing as quality journalism and it is being done all the time and it's, you know, when it, it's the thing that I think some, the question about how we rebuild the basis of reality is clearly connected to getting more people to read it. Um, I don't think we should, you know, the journalism is never the last word and if you want something, um, that, you know, that will last longer, you almost always need some perspective, some time perspective. Because let's keep writing books, right? Let's keep writing history books. Yeah, history books. I'm, I'm with you on that. <laughs> Next question, which side are we on now? Over there? Okay. Hi, I'm Mateen. I'm a freshman here. Uh, so we talked a lot about on the provider side, whether it's uh, social media or media platform. But we didn't really talk about the consumer side. So how can, can we even approach this problem from the consumer side by educating the public? I mean, obviously it's not an easy job. As you mentioned, this study that even on this campus, there's three out of four students who can't recognize between like uh, fake news and real news, but. Um, I don't think it was on this campus, just to be clear. I think okay, it, okay. Here, so everybody was, knows. It, okay. The, the researchers are from this campus looking at uh, high school and middle school students. I will post the, the link to the paper on my Twitter feed at McFall after the event, just to, so we get the facts correct okay. on this. Okay, so. I'm glad that's clear. Good. Okay. So how can we approach this from the consumer side? Well, I think part of the problem is you're, you're having too much influence being exercised by consumers these days. Uh, it is quite literally the consumer demand that drives Fox News. It is the consumer demand that is driving MSNBC. It is consumer demand that is, that is warping journalism into providing an echo of the prejudices that people already carry, rather than being an objective uh, uh, accounting of reality, which apparently is, is less marketable these days. That's, that's precisely my point. I think we need to get back to uh, a demand on the part of the consumer for objective facts. They're not as much fun as opinion, but they're a lot healthier for a democracy. So what do you think on this? Um, I think I, I mean, the way I see it is you have to be valuable and appreciated by the consumer. So I don't think news organizations should take the eat your vegetables approach. Um, and I think I maybe have a little more optimism in um, groups of people's desire to be informed um, I think the product has to be easy to consume, it has to be relevant, it has to be frictionless, all those wonderful tech buzzy things. Um, but it, it also, and I guess also has to be relevant. I mean, I, I think there is a, with the internet we've seen like the rise of, um, talking to your question about opinion, like voice and these things that, that can cloud objectivity, but they can also, um, be very relevant to the reader and, and put things in the language and frame the issues in a way that's relevant to the audience. And um, I think that is one thing that large publications are not very good at. Um, by design, they have to, they're trying to find a voice and a lens that appeals to millions of people. So um, I'm also optimistic about other outlets that are as committed to quality information but can find a way to um, be super relevant to the audience so that the consumer um, you know, doesn't sort of feel like they're eating their vegetables. Is there a role for non-market forces in this world? I mean, I think about Stanford University. If we, if we just relied on the consumers, quote unquote, that is students and the, the, the money they pay here, we could never produce the research that we do here. We have all kinds of, we rely on the government 
Uh, we rely on in private individuals, where maybe some of you are in the room right now. And if you think, you know, found, some foundations are in that world, some rich people support individual magazines, not because of the market, but because of a belief. Is, it, will that be part of the market? And will maybe the blending of the platforms and the content, I'm still, I'm thinking of the divorce versus the merge, right? And, and maybe I'm too fixed, fixated on Netflix that, that used to just provide other people's content and now they're making their own. Could, but then, I mean, it gets, so I think there are many possible funders for news and, um, you know, we, we have a little bit of a crisis here, so all models are worth exploring, but every model does come um, with risks to objectivity, with risks to um, sustainability. There are wonderful right. nonprofits in this space, but they're dependent on one or two families wanting to renew them. So I actually believe journalism's too important not to be a business um, that is supported by the market forces of the value of its product. Um, and I think, you know, a world where Facebook is funding news articles is a a uh, reporter who writes a lot about Facebook, that freaks me out. Got, so, got it, got yeah. it, got it. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions. Hi, uh, my name is Sam Weinberg. I teach in the Graduate School of Education. I want to go back to the example of the white helmets uh, where most of your search results were from RT. I would imagine that the great majority of people, if I were to use the acronym SEO or spelled it out, search engine optimization, they wouldn't quite understand what I was talking about. There's also other work that's, that shows that uh, 85 to 90 percent of college students never go beyond the, the, the first, no, never go beyond the scroll, never go beyond the first SERP, the search engine result right. page. So you, we've talked about consumers, we've talked about the kinds of pressure we can bring to bear on the platforms, we've talked about some government policy. I'm watching you, but you can't see behind you, and I'm seeing the name Stanford University. So I'm wondering, in your opinion, what should a university do? What should our K-12 system do? What should we do educationally to address these issues? So I, I think that gets pretty quickly to the question of media literacy campaigns, um, which is in the conversation about Russian propaganda, particularly in Ukraine and places where it's very strong, uh, one of the responses has been precisely that. You know, can you teach people how to recognize a faked photograph? Can you teach people to question when they see a video? Um, uh, you know, can you teach them how to identify where it comes from or help them you know, learn, to, learn to identify where, how they might have a better or worse sense of, of whether it's true or not? Um, and there have been some very interesting um, attempts to do that, not inside the educational system, but through uh, civic groups through trying to create viral videos that are lecture videos that are that that that, that impart these kinds of tactics. Um, a lot of them are based on the assumption that people don't want to be fooled, and so they say, you know, don't be fooled, don't be don't be made a fool of. Here's how you can check. Here are some of the ways in which you can identify whether something is true or false. So I can really imagine um, media literacy campaigns working like that. But I think it's also true that the um, the educational system, particularly in school and younger, has been behind in helping children understand what the internet is, what on it is true, what is false, and making that a kind of basic part of education the way we were once taught to identify different parts of the newspaper seems beyond obvious to me. And you know, I know a few places have done it, but not, not many yet. So we're almost out of time. I think we have 30 seconds left. You have a question in the back still? Let's ask two questions. There was a selection bias with the questions because our people with our microphones were being modest and didn't want to come up in the light. So to those that got discriminated against, you'll get the last question. So penultimate question back there. Why don't we take both these questions and then you can answer them and we'll be done. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm a Stanford student. So we talked about some potential solutions to the issues today and my question is, what if these solutions don't work? Will there be counter-propaganda campaigns? And if so, what will they look like? Hold your thoughts. Last question. Um, my name is Angelica. I'm an educator at a 612 school in the Bay Area. And my question is, what has become the role of 
Twitter as a primary source of information. I remember in 2014 during um, you know, the Russian invasion in Ukraine and during those discussions, you, New York Times would use tweets from Yatsenyuk and others as a primary source. So what, you know, on the primary source and then also um, what's become the role of the spin room with social media and with sort of that direct communication to the consumer through a platform such as Twitter. Thank you. Two big hard questions and no time. So who wants to go first? Who wants to go last? Ted, let's just go this way and Anne will get the last word. You can say whatever you want. I haven't got a clue. <laughs> so, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to answer either one of those questions except to say that we have got to find a way in this country to relieve the tribalism. Uh, it, it's, it's too easy to blame the tribalism on the media. Uh, the media clearly are to blame in some respect, but I think we have to find a way, uh, and it may be that volunteerism is part of the answer. I happen to believe that some form of universal service uh, in which young people from different parts of the country are thrown together in a situation where they are obliged to collaborate in terms of solving a problem, that that is going to do more in the long run to, to do away with this kind of, uh, this, this world of, of two different media universes that we live in right now. It's, it's devastating. It is going to undermine everything that this country stands for, and I'll leave it to Anne to be the optimist as she has been throughout. <laughs> Jessica, um, final uh, word. Uh, just on the Twitter point, I mean, it, it's absolutely true if you look at the president that the tr Twitter is raw material for um, many, many news articles a day, an hour, um, and that's just true across a lot of public figures. and. Um, I think obviously, if to the extent it's newsworthy and it's a primary source, we need to be covering it. Um, I do worry though that we have some very lazy newsrooms that are um, sitting and just refreshing Twitter all day to try and um, react to something that someone says because it's a lot easier than doing original reporting. So um, I occasionally joke that I'm gonna IP block Twitter in the information newsroom so that our reporters cannot go on Twitter during the day and actually have to pick up the phone. Good. Yeah. The answer to the question of what happens if we don't find a solution um, and we begin to have propaganda and counter propaganda um, and that's and, and an increasing partisanship and deeper bifurcation, the answer is you get civil war. I mean, and it's, it's not, that sounds absurd in the American context because our civil war was so long ago. Um, but if you look around the world, if you look at the history of Europe and the run up to the Second World War, um, if you look at a dozen other conflicts, almost all of them begin as, uh, as, as, as you can call it a propaganda war, you can call it polarization, you can call it opposing narratives, whatever word you want to use, but almost all of them begin as verbal conflict. You know, people are divided over an issue, over, uh, sometimes over a conspiracy theory, sometimes over, sometimes over something real, sometimes over something fake. Um, but nevertheless, it eventually leads them to, um, to fight one another. I mean, and, and the moment when it becomes violent, that's the moment, of course, when it then takes on a, a different dynamic. So, yeah, I think the, I think the solution to this is um, needed and very urgent. See, I knew I could count on you to put an optimistic glow on things. <laughs> Civil War. Well, let me end on an uh, optimistic note. First, a point of information. We invoked Peter Baker a couple of times. Uh, uh, just so you know, he will be speaking here on campus next week at the Freeman Spogli Institute talking about the relationship between media and Trump's foreign policy to Isaac's original question. So uh, look for that on the website over at FSI. He's here next week. Uh, but the second thing I want to say, uh, for me, the one bit of optimism, I've, I've interacted with journalists for three or four decades now, um, and they are in America and around the world, by the way. If I had more time, I would talk about some incredibly brave people I know in Russia. Uh, they're, not, they're people that have to worry about the market, but they also are people that are committed to the truth. 
they're committed to something bigger than just the profession. And uh, they tend to be really smart, analytic people. And I think you saw that on demonstration tonight. And these are the kind of people that give me hope that we do not end in civil war, but we do not go into that dystopian world that you talked about, but we will have a better future with, that includes a lot of very high quality news and information. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks to the panel.